My name is Cody Trevilian. I'm a PhD student at Oakland University, and I'll be speaking about time-dependent differential equation networks and uh, inevitably release the package associated with it called TD DiffieQNets. Hello. Uh, how's everybody? Yeah, good. Awesome. Uh, my name is Cody Trevilian. I'm a PhD student in applied and computational physics. And today I will be talking to you, oh, I'm, I'm at uh, Oakland University. Uh, today I'll be talking to you about time-dependent differential equation networks uh, that's going to inevitably be packaged up in something maybe we'll call uh, TD Diffie Q networks. Um, just if, yeah, nice fun name. Um, my co-author is Dr. Vasil Tiburkevich. She is my research advisor and uh, I should note that the preliminary code work, um, some of the foundational structures were built by uh, James Voorhees, who's uh, unfortunately left us for industry. So um, this is the abstract. It's a, a bit to read, but um, if you'd like, it's there and it's available. Um, so basically, uh, these time-dependent differential equation neurons um, describe the action of you know, physical neurons. These can be biological or um, you know, any, any sort of uh, system that evolves over time. You, uh, you, know, you aren't locked into the model that we show. Uh, but the benefit of biological neurons is that they really, only, uh, they really only fire when you interact with them, right? So that then gives us something like a, a spiking action. So here I show a series of four neurons, and they each can carry signal from the first uh, through to the last. And you'll see that this is a very nice uh, thing to have, especially if you want to set up a system of these neurons in a network and uh, have the signal cascade from uh, start to finish with as little you know, extra energy as possible. Um, so like I said, these physical neurons are, aren't, you know, limited to biological systems. Um, and as we'll see, there's other systems that can be used beyond, um, maybe you've heard of like the Hodgkin-Huxley model or um, some other uh, fun systems that exist. But basically, the reason why we want this spiking action is that, you know, the brain is awesome and it uses uh, spiking signals. So that's why we inevitably have something called spiking neural networks. Um, and we'll see that these, uh, these are kind of difficult to uh, implement in the basic neural network uh, package that's available. So we built this. Uh, yeah. So these networks uh, inevitably are for neuromorphic computing. Um, and if you're not sure of what that is, Basically, there are chips that can emulate these uh, digital signals such that you have kind of spiking action going from one, uh, one part of the chip to the other. Uh, but even still, these are subject, uh, some of them, to the von Neumann bottleneck, which is the separation of the memory unit and the processing unit. The brain itself has these kind of you know, intertwined uh, the various parts of the neuron can act independently of one another and process information the same as they can work together. So what we implement is uh, representative of this, right? Um, so if, if you've, uh, let's see, there's you know, systems that exist, right, with uh, some various efficiencies to them. Uh, here I show that here's the human being. Uh, you have Deep Blue IBM and you know uh, AlphaGo. If you're not familiar with Deep Blue, this is the system that uh, Gary Kasparov fought a valiant battle against and inevitably lost. Um, of course, then later we had AlphaGo, where uh, Lee Sedol fought the same battle and ultimately lost. Uh, these are, of course, two very different systems. Um, Deep Blue was a, a system of specialized hardware. There was 
something like 480 actual uh, chess playing chips. So in, in our current definition of kind of deep learning and artificial intelligence, it's not really deep learning or artificial intel, well, I guess it would be artificial intelligence in that it had a library of uh, moves that it could cycle through very, very quickly. AlphaGo, on the other hand, um, is not specialized hardware. It's just a set of CPUs and GPUs that uh, consume, as you can see, way more power per element than that of uh, Deep Blue IBM, but AlphaGo uh, can play itself from literally nothing, and we get uh, it playing Go, which is um, kind of a bit of a feat in itself. And yeah, but, but as you can see, with specialized hardware, you can get a lot greater efficiency than you do with something that's more generalized of an approach like AlphaGo. Then we actually do have some systems that are uh, neuromorphic chips that exist, right? So there's True North from IBM, Loihi from Intel, and uh, this group at Manchester University made something called Spinnaker, which actually replicates um, a billion neurons. Uh, it's one of the most efficient in terms of its uh, elements per neuron, apart, of course, from the human being. They're, they're at about 50 some odd, it's about 56 neurons uh, per, sorry, 56 uh, cores per neuron. And then here we have IBM, which is, albeit much more efficient in the power category, that is at about 5,400. And then Loihi Intel just kind of, you know, does its own thing over here. But here, you know, we're, we're human beings. We have a one-to-one -one ratio of uh, elements per neuron. And so the general conclusion is that we have specialized hardware that's more efficient than generalized approaches. And current hardware is getting better over time, but uh, the brain is way better than these. So we want that single element implementation. And it would be just very nice um, if we could have that. So uh, those were nice examples of what I would call digital neurons. Uh, but what we want to replicate are physical neurons, which are systems that we will inevitably build uh, in a physical space that are not subject to digital algorithms. So they're not uh, summations of some thousands of uh, cores, right? They are dynamical systems that can function over time. And as this is uh, in direct contrary to digital neurons, which are just straight input output. Um, they don't have an internal state necessarily that they can uh, hold memory in. And so it's kind of like this uh, functional approach here where it's, you know, I say f of input equals output and they're, you know, many element. But then you can have physical neurons that have a stimulus response relationship. And these are, you know, dynamical time dependent uh, systems that have a memory of their internal state. And we can see that you can represent those with the time dependent differential equations that I'll show. And you know, here it's just a fun little equation, you know, stimulus with the time dependence, response with the time dependence, and you get a change in your, your output based on the uh, state of the internal system. And these, of course, we want a single element because it's, yeah, it's just uh, way cooler that way. So here we see that you can have uh, right, it's a time-dependent differential equation neuron network. And there we start using uh, just a very general idea of the physical neurons. They're not limited to biological systems. You could, of course, have the Hodgkin-Huxley equation here. Um, I'm not as familiar with that, but I am familiar with, uh, with this equation where we have uh, some sets of parameters that dictate the behavior of a antiferromagnetic and normal metal bilayer, uh, which can function in a single element uh, 
single element orientation, and inevitably we build them out into, or we want to build them out physically into a network, and you see that you can do the cascade that I showed initially. Um, of course, other systems do exist, uh, but here we have a nice relationship where you can get the bias of the neuron in terms of this uh, input parameter here. And that would be something of a, of a input current from either your uh, recognition space or the action of the previous neuron that is firing. And so here you can show that based on the coupling between these neurons, which would be analogous to the weight of the connections between them, um, you can have a solvable system that you can input right into ND solve, and then it runs away with it, and you can put in any kind of adjacency matrix that you want. And so it included in this notebook actually is all of the code that, uh, that we've written. So you can go in and make your own time-dependent differential equation that has some sort of a dependent input parameter based on the previous action of the neurons and get a coupling matrix here and then do with it, uh, with it what you will. So it's, uh, I'll just show it for fun since I figured out how to hide it, but it's a very long set of code. So if you want to spend an entire afternoon looking through that, you're more than welcome. Um, so basically I built out four main functions. There are uh, various uh, purposes to each of them. The Diffie-QNet creates the physical system, the physical neuron network. Then the NetSim simulates it, uh, the current state of the system, because you'll be able to change it with the NetTrain function that modifies the physical neuron network according to some learning algorithm, and that can be determined by, uh, by the user. What we currently use is something of a um, rough, loose, uh, stochastic gradient descent-like method. It's not exactly stochastic gradient descent, but um, that's certainly implementable. And I can detail that uh, a little bit further on. But then we can visualize the behavior of this system with a DiffieQ uh, net plot function that will show the spiking action that you saw initially. Um, there are several helper functions that uh, take us uh, along the way. And that's uh, one of the biggest ones is this graph layer list that kind of algorithmically organizes things. And you have uh, some other style plots and. Uh, some really fun things. This is this last function is something uh, for the future. We haven't been able to get the multi-level perceptron um, method running, but if anybody would like to contribute to that, they are certainly more than welcome to, and I would love to talk to them about it. So as we continue here, right, we have the synapse matrix, and uh, here I set some input uh, this uh, adjacency matrix, and then you have an input current that you set each of your neurons to. So this is that simple use case that we saw initially, the four neuron chain. And then you have, uh, basically you just set a reference to it, and you can get all of these beautiful equations to fall out of it. And this is all as a result of ND solve. Um, well, actually, these, these are what we input into ND solve. And this can be uh, as big as, you know, as big as you can imagine. Um, barring the, the efficiencies of ND solve, we have done, you know, random, real, populated uh, weights of the, the uh, adjacency matrix and solved a thousand by thousand matrices in, you know, a matter of, uh, seconds because ND solve is pretty awesome. So here I show the connectivity matrix as we call it. That's the uh, description of the synapses between them. 
between each of the neurons, and then you have the connectivity matrix here. Then, of course, you can take a look at what you get out of it, which is the series of interpolating functions that ndSolve makes for you. There's end conditions and, and different things there. But the fun thing is that we can have these plots auto populate, I believe. Yes, here we are. So that was uh, a redo of the, you know, the output that was already there. Uh, nothing too special, but we see that the spike carries from each of each neuron to the next, and this is a measure of some abstracted parameter in the physical system that was described by the differential equation. So if we want to look at kind of the general algorithm for the net train function, uh, the output's kind of randomly selected uh, from the input vector. We simulate it, then we compare that against the desired output and calculate the error, update the current vector or connectivity array, and then the method is ceased after either a defined number of iterations or when you have an error of zero, which um, probably represents an overtrained system. Uh, but here I show a connectivity matrix for AND and one for OR. And if we wanted to uh, kind of see what these look like, can just plug them into the styled adjacency plot and get out this uh, kind of and looking gate. These are what would, what would be called input, uh, input neurons. And then here's kind of this hidden space and then you have the output neuron here. Then if we want to train these, and actually the, the colors here are representative of the, you know, the uh, the weights of the neurons and let's see if, okay, so I much like maybe some others, don't like, yes, ah, okay, here we are. So we have this trained and synapse matrix and you see that, you know, you have a zero, one, you get out zero, a one zero, you get out a zero. And if you have a one one, look at that, you get a one. That's exactly what we want. And that, uh, if you want to believe it or not, that trained the system in something like 30 epochs using the uh, synapse method. So uh, this is all built out in this notebook and it's ready for people to, to experiment. So here I train the same system uh, the same initial system. Actually, I'm inputting the AND matrix here. Um, and so I get the 0, 1, the 1, 0. There's 0, 1 outputs the 1, 1, 0 outputs the 1, and the 1, 1 outputs the 1. So this is all very good. And that's using adjustment of the weights. Then here I can show the uh, same process occurring with the, uh, the current trainer, which is albeit a bit more unstable, but still uh, still pretty awesome. So you get the zero, one, you get the zero, one, zero, zero, one, 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 we all know, uh, we all know truth tables, right? So then same thing, I input the AND matrix and I get uh, this, this OR function coming out. So, you know, you can do AND and OR pretty easy and it's, you know, more or less user friendly once you wrap your head around it. There are, of course, more improvements that can occur, but you have this big uh, input vector space and you have the, the inputs and the, out, the desired outputs and that uh, should be relatively easy for anyone who wants to use it to, to use it. So here we can show the effect of, you know, a zero one input just by executing the uh, plot functions. And you see that there are spikes that show up and then the position of these, uh, this abstracted parameter here. 
uh, if we wanted, we could see what happens when we switch these and actually show that this is not too much of a parlor trick and you get the uh, other neurons firing. So if you see the colors stay the same, but the other neurons fire here. And here they are with their uh, parameters progressing across the, the space that we want them to. So we can do the same thing for OR, which is maybe a little bit more visual when you want to switch it. So we'll get that ready. See what happens. Yeah, okay. So we see the uh, previous output down here, and we will get a new output after that. And it's exactly what we uh, saw before, but of course, uh, different colors. So the big change is when you have uh, the, the one and one, and you see them all fire. And then you really recognize that it's a system, uh, system of neurons. And here we have the, the fifth one firing. And we see that, you know, it's actually, uh, they're all firing at the same time, so it's a little bit difficult to see. But none of them are left down here not having fired. So this is good. Um, and a little bit more advanced of an application of this, which can inevitably be something of a basic approach would be an XOR gate. And that's kind of the, uh, the lowest level test for if your, uh, if your network can do something like a uh, nonlinear uh, approximation of some function. So here I'm running it for about 200 epochs. And I see that when I have two uh, initial inputs, I get out no output. Then I have something, it's a one zero, and I get the one. Um, this, this, these last two are inevitably firing to a final output neuron that's appended at the end. And so then here I have zero one, and I get zero one, which then these ones propagate forward, and I get this final output here, which we see. You have two one inputs, you get zero, and one zero, you get one, zero one, and you get uh, you know one, which is awesome. And we can visualize this, of course, with the same functions and see that the system behaves as we want it to behave. So here we have the, the inputs, and they're firing, and we have the seventh neuron firing which is our desired output. The parameters process across the space, and this is good. Then we can show that this next input is different, and you can really do any sort of system that you want. So here I'm firing both of them, well, uh, one and zero, and we get this output. So um, it's, it's a really versatile system and uh, you can kind of do with it uh, what you will. Ah, uh, yes, so this is the, uh, the zero one. So that was the one one, which is why we didn't see the seventh neuron fire. And we have a zero one input, and we'll see the, the seventh neuron fire, which is uh, a good thing, and our system works like we trained it to. Um, yeah, this was uh, a very long time coming, so. Uh, basically, the, the key takeaway from this is that you have spiking neural networks, uh, and those working with neuromorphic computing uh, are becoming way more popular. They're more efficient and more versatile than, than you know, traditional neural network approaches. Um, physical neuron networks are going to be central to efficient spiking neural networks. And if we can have a single element implementation, of specialized hardware, that's, uh, that's what we want. So thank you to the Wolfram language that can do that. A few, my email's here, yeah, so.
is the things. Um, 